Good evening and welcome to the Sound Off Show. My name is Linda Kirker. I host the program and I'm happy that you tuned in tonight. I think you're really going to enjoy this show. It's a, a little different from topics I often talk about and I think it's extremely worthwhile and I, I think you're going to appreciate it a lot. Before I introduce my guest, I just want to read this uh, little message about hope, which I think is important to all of us. It's a positive thing, isn't it? Hope looks for the good in people instead of harping on the worst. Hope opens doors where despair closes them. Hope discovers what can be done instead of grumbling about what cannot. Hope draws its power from a deep trust in God and the basic goodness of human nature. Hope lights a candle instead of cursing the darkness. Hope regards problems, small or large, as opportunities. Hope cherishes no illusions, nor does it yield to cynicism. Hope acts, excuse me, hope sets big goals and is not frustrated by repeated difficulties or setbacks. Hope pushes ahead when it would be easy to quit. Hope puts up with modest gains, realizing that the longest journey starts with one step. Hope accepts misunderstandings as the price for serving the greater good of others. Hope is a good loser because it has the divine assurance of final victory. There we go. And I think that fits in very nicely with what we're going to be discussing tonight. My guest tonight is, well, I think back for the second time, Tom Murphy. Hi there. Welcome back. It's a pleasure. So nice to have you here again. I, um, f for you folks who don't know, um, I think probably most people do know him, <laughs> but he's the owner, the proprietor of Twig's Restaurant right here on Main Street in St. Albans. And he also is, uh, are you co-founder? Yes. Of co-founder of Sweethearts and Heroes. And if you don't know what that's all about, you're going to enjoy learning because it's a phenomenal thing that Tom is doing around the country and, um, with that, I'm going to let him start uh, to tell you a little bit about what he's doing. Uh, superhero work, Linda. <laughs> there you go. And people say, well, what does that mean? And I say, well, what are superheroes? And when I ask kids that question, they typically say to me, um, somebody with superpowers. And I say, well, mm. you know, the bad guys have superpowers, too. There you go. And they say, oh, that's right. And I say, well, what makes someone a superhero? And the, the fact is, and this is my definition of what a superhero is, it's just someone willing to do things other people aren't willing to do. Wow, that's a good so definition. So you never saw Superman fly up to someone as they were falling from a building and get in their face and say, ooh, I think I'm going to let this one hit the street. Oh, dear. <laughs> you couldn't imagine that, could you? No. Because Superman doesn't care who that person's father is or who that person's mother is or what they smell like. His job is to help everyone, especially right thing. those that are in need the most. Wow, that's a good example. And, uh, and that's what I've been doing for about the last eight years of my life. Um, I've spent uh, the last three years full time on the road uh, across this great country from Hawaii to Texas um, wow. to the Northeast, uh, talking to kids. Wow. And, um, you know, something is pretty remarkable, and I don't use remarkable in a good way. Um, for the first time in human history, the number one thing to take the life of a 10 to 14 year old mm. are their own hands. Now, Linda, in your lifetime, the number one thing to take the life of a 10 to 14 year old has always been car accidents. Yeah. Last year, that was just overtaken by their own hands. Well, that is horrifying. Um, it shouldn't be happening in this country. It shouldn't be happening anywhere, but <clears throat> I, I would like to think, and I'm, I'm pretty confident that um, when you speak with these young people that you grab their attention because 
they, they can sense when someone is speaking with them, if their heart's in it, sure. if they sincerely want to openly communicate about things that are important about life. Sure. And so it's how sad it is. And then the reasons why young people are taking their lives. Can we talk about that? You know, um, my, my partner Rick and I, and uh, Rick, I call him one of the world's hope experts. Yes. If anyone online, if anyone's watching now that wants to go online, go to www.rickyarish, Y-A-R-S-O-H, yarish.net, and you can uh, check out Rick. And when you first look at his um, website or you check Rick out on Facebook, you're, you're, you're taken back a little bit. You're shocked. 70% mm -hmm. uh, of Rick's body was burned away in Iraq. Um, he served our country and hit an IED um, yeah. when he was in a Bradley, which is a small tank. And um, Rick tells the story and he says, I laid on the ground and looked up in the sky and just decided to die. Wow. I gave up on this thing called hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, he always tells kids, it's fortunate that I only did for a second because I ended up rolling one more time. I fell into a canal that I didn't know was there. No kidding. Put the flames out and then they found him in the canal. And then he spent the next 10 years of his life kind of rebuilding. Yes. And living in a state of hopelessness. Wow. And uh, that's why I call Rick one of the world's hope experts. And when I get the opportunity to go to schools with Rick, um, there's a lot of kids there, Linda, that look at Rick Yarish and say, that's how I feel on the inside. Yeah. So as we start to get to the heart of, you know, why has this epidemic happened in the most technologically advanced civilization planet Earth has ever known, mm -hmm. we have more 10 to 14 year olds taking their lives than at any point in history. So you say, why? Are you making a connection between technology and children taking their lives or I can see where that could be a factor sure um, if they get onto a site where there's bullying um, or um, maybe they don't have personal connections with people so they go to, you know go to that place I tell parents and teachers this cauldron and the cauldron has a name it's made up of a lot of things and there's a little bit of technology. There's the death of empathy. There's parenting issues. There's all kinds of things that are in this cauldron that make up this soup. And the soup is called hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason that 22 service members take their own lives every oh, no. day in this country. There's a reason why our children are leaving this planet at an unprecedented rate. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to one thing whether it's a service member or a child, they get themselves to a point of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And hope for our organization stands for hold on, possibilities exist. Oh, nice. Hold on, possibilities exist. <laughs> I'll remind you. And what Rick says to kids is that as he laid there on the ground, he didn't see the possibilities that existed for his future. Yep. And he, when you're in a state of hopelessness, it's pretty darn hard to see that. To climb out. That's right. Yeah. But when you have a model like Rick Yarish, and not just his story in Iraq, but when he got back, he had to deal with hands that were f fused together. Oh, my god. He had to deal with not having a leg. He had to deal with a heck of a lot of hopelessness. All the burns. All the burns. But I think the greatest hopelessness uh, that Rick dealt with was the fact that one of the first things was that little kids were horrified of him because they saw a monster. Sure. And Rick loved kids, and uh, he understood why kids were looking at him funny, uh, but he had a real difficult time with that. So oh, Rick yeah. battled this thing called hopelessness. And the funny thing about hope and hopelessness is all of us carry this thing called hope inside of us, all of us. And this one of the secrets when you talk about what a sweetheart is because people say well tom what is this name sweethearts and heroes a sweetheart is a carrier of hope mm -hmm. a hero is someone that's willing to do things other people aren't willing to do yeah but when we talk about sweethearts the carriers of hope we all have that ability to give hope to other people we have and to stir it up within ourselves that's right and every time rick got hope back it came from someone else 
It came from a little girl. It came from a doctor. It came from a stranger. And that's kind of, that, that's one of the things that we work on kids with, is recognizing the hope that you have inside of you and giving it to the people that need it the most, those kids that are hopeless. And do you know what I've often said, Tom, is that when we put ourselves out there for someone else's need, at the same time, whether we realize it or not, we are helping ourselves. Sure because we feel good about ourselves, that we extended ourselves to help someone else through a problem. Sure. Um, I, and I, I probably said this on the show before, but I, I'm a person of faith, and I believe that the good Lord has put me in places where people have had a need, whether it was just to talk with someone who will listen, or give them a hug, <laughs> free hugs. <laughs> Um, I, I, I can't wait to show you my t-shirt. Hugs are healing. Yes, they are. And a lot of other things, but we won't go there now. So um, I understand what you're saying about people are trapped within their own, sometimes our own thinking. Sure. You know, let alone the circumstances around us. So, um, okay, so I want to hear more from you <laughs> about that. Uh, possibilities do exist. They do. But we have to do the work to get there. Sure. And if you're just isolated. Sure. And you don't have, you don't put yourself out there because you're all caught up in your impossibilities sure. attitude, then um, that makes it even worse. Sure. And then maybe that's where these young people have been who didn't see a way out. Sure which we, we can't continue to let that happen. We can't help everybody, but we can try. Sure. Well, you know, I think one of, one of the greatest lessons we can um, salvage, you know, as we open the black box up and we look at what's happening and what has happened and what is happening, um, empathy and whether there's Michigan State's study, um, San, I think San Jose State did a good study on this, um, but empathy in our kids has plummeted over 40% in the last 30 years. Now, let me put it to you a little different way. Um, 30 years ago, when you were in high school, right? <laughs> nice try. <laughs> but anyone out there listening, 30 years ago when you were in high school, you can still remember the name oh. of the kid that wasn't treated the right way. Everyone can think back and remember that kid's name. The kid that looked funny, smelled funny, his dad was an alcoholic, you know, they lived in a trailer. There were, yeah. there were those kids, and we can all remember those kids. I remember that kid, Brian Lindstad. Mm -hmm. He wasn't treated the right way. But the difference was Brian and all of those kids 30 years ago had a 40% better chance that one of their peers was going to show or give them some kind of empathy. So with almost the death of empathy being slashed in half, those kids today that have the same life struggles, trials, tribulations, they're getting less empathy from their peers, which for a kid in adolescence, there's no greater thing than their peers. They almost, they leave one pack, which is their family, mm -hmm. and they migrate to another pack, which most parents have a really difficult time transitioning. Yeah. But I talk to a lot of, do a lot of parent work. Good. And they have that tough transition. But the Letting only thing go, that kid of. wants is acceptance from his or her peers. And today's children have at least a 40 to 50% less um, people showing them empathy. Okay, so let's, let's investigate that a little sure. bit. Sure. Um, because I'm, my mind is going here as you're speaking and I'm thinking, okay, does that be, is that because no one has modeled empathy to them, like in the home, sure. for instance? Um, or, I'm trying to think of other reasons. Uh, let, me, let me give you four. Please do. So when I talk to parents, teachers, and kids, I have different programs for each one. But there's four things that we work on that say we kill empathy. Now, if you're a classroom teacher, I would tell you to focus on these four things. If you're a mom, I would tell you to focus on these four things. If you're a student, you have to understand why empathy is dying. So number one, first and foremost, is less personal connection. 
mm -hmm. largely due to technology. Now, Linda, it is said that this generation will spend more time holding a yep, holding a phone. phone than holding a hand. So human beings this have been holding <laughs> hands for thousands of years. Humans have. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This is the first generation that will spend more time holding a phone than holding a hand. An inanimate object. That's right. Now, I'm not saying that these are bad devices. They're wonderful no, no, no. tools. But in their place. That's right. Now, our kids are communicating more than they ever have, but they're not personally connecting. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And where did you learn personal connection? From my family. From your family? On the playground? That's true. You looked at people's faces. Yep. And when you saw my face and you saw distress, sadness, joy, elation, you could read it and you learned to build empathy. Now the brain is wired to learn how to increase empathy, but also if you don't exercise it, which we call empathetic fitness, mm -hmm. we make sure that we make our kids and the kids we work with more empathetically fit by getting them to personally connect with other kids and there's lots of ways you can do it and the deepest form of connection is trust the people you trust the most are the people you have the open deepest connection with you open up to them that's right? right so there's the one thing that we work on with kids is personal trust. connection okay right so personal connection right you got to get kids to personally connect number two fear and anxiety record levels of fear and anxiety in our children's today. They say, and I was just telling the guy in the booth, we were having a little discussion, I said, this is a good way to think about it. Our kids, they say, have more depression than during the Great Depression. Uh. That's tough to think about. Our children today, in one of the best economies ever, right? Our kids today are more anxious than during the Cold War. So really think about the, the struggles, and you remember some of those times the Cold War and the anxiety people had when they were thinking about what could happen. Our children today have more anxiety today than during that period in history. So when you talk about the rise of fear and anxiety and the chemicals that are swimming around in their bloodstream like mm -hmm. cortisol, mm -hmm. if kids that are coming to school and into their social situations with record levels of fear and anxiety. Now Rick has a beautiful story that he tells when he was dealing with this. And this is the best way I can illustrate his fear, it. His fear and anxiety that's right, that's that right. people wouldn't accept him once that's they right. saw his disfigurement. That's right. So Rick, one of the most empathetic people I've ever met in my life. I'm gonna to explain to you how fear and anxiety will kill empathy. So Rick is in the grocery store when he was really struggling with kids not accepting him. Mm -hmm. And he's in his wheelchair and at the end of the aisle, enter the aisle, comes a young man, you know, seven, eight years old. Locks eyes with Rick. Rick was in his wheelchair, so eventually they were going to pass each other, eye to eye. And as they get closer and closer, remember this was happening to Rick all the time. The kid's hiding behind his mom. The mom's not paying attention. And when he gets right up next to the kid, right, he was so distraught with this feeling that he's been feeling for months that when the kid gets up next to him, he went Aww. and scared him on purpose. Aww. Now. Sometimes when Rick tells a story, there's a little humor in it. Um, but the point is, one of the most empathetic people you've ever met lost all of his empathy because he was dealing with fear and anxiety. So when you have kids that are full of fear and anxiety, how can they show empathy? They can't. Because it's about survival. It's about self-survival. Dead on. Dead on. They're in a survival mechanism at that point. Yeah. So there's two things that kill empathy. Less personal connection, largely due to technology. Record levels of fear and anxiety. Now, we work with kids, and we can't spend hours here talking about this, but we work with kids, and how do we reduce fear and anxiety in certain situations? How can they open up and feel less fear and anxiety in schools and situations? Trust is That's one right. thing. Right. You ready for number three? Go. Or do you want to ask a question? No. Okay. Number three is the unwillingness to be vulnerable. Now, humans are hardwired not to be vulnerable, right? And that's from way down here in the base of our skull in like the amygdala, the lizard brain, right? A thousand years ago, you didn't put your head into an empty cave 
because no. it might get bit <laughs> off, right? Yeah. So we're just wired as uh, mammals to be careful, Yes. right? Yeah. Because you don't want, and if you think about anything in modern, you don't have to worry about a saber-toothed tiger jumping out and grabbing you anymore. Not here. Not here, that's right. <laughs> but vulnerability is a tough thing. And if you think, why don't people raise their hand in class? If you think about those little vulnerable situations. Oh, yeah. Now. What if I'm wrong? That's right. Then I'm going to feel anxious. That's right. So why would a kid jump into action and help another kid, especially a kid that smells? Do you know how hard it is to help a kid that smells? I remember in, in um, probably second or third grade uh, of just that thing. Yeah. And the kids would all pick on this girl. And so I would go over to her and, and talk with her. Sure. Because I, I didn't like what they were doing. Sure. You know, she couldn't, um, she couldn't help. She probably didn't even know sure. that there was an odor around her. Well, I would call that a superhero move. But what you did went over, alleviated some of her suffering. But the reality is... For the most part, that doesn't happen to those kids. Yeah. And it's not because the other kids are bad. It's just because they have a hard time just naturally not becoming vulnerable. Now, vulnerability, you can, tr you can train, mm -hmm. right? There's lots of ways that you can train yourself to become more vulnerable. It takes practice, right, to, to put yourself in Look a... Look at the military. That's right. What they have to go through mentally... Yep to put themselves in those situations. <laughs> That's a little bit more extreme than I was talking yeah. about, but, <laughs> but you're dead on. And um, we can work on some ways to make kids more vulnerable because when you become vulnerable and you can show people your own feelings, right, then it's easier to help someone, especially that's hopeless. Well, you know something um, I was thinking about uh, as you were speaking? Um, I was listening, though. Sure. <laughs> um, I, I was looking for something to watch on TV the other night. And I was looking for a movie, and there were all of these murder things and, and weird uh, uh, characters and weird outfits and everything. I think young people today are exposed to a lot of the media things, um, entertainment, so to speak, yeah. that's frightening. I really do. There's certainly, uh, <laughs> that's a giant topic we could talk about. Well, no, we don't have what to. What kids are exposed to uh, today is something I spent a lot of time talking to parents with. Good. Um, you know, the age appropriateness of things that kids are exposed to and, and the development stage of their brain, which brings me to empathy killer number four. Yes, sir. So, so number one was less personal connection, largely due to technology, getting kids to reconnect. We would say the, you have to activate it. Right? And then we talked about fear and anxiety. And courage and confidence is the activator for that that we work on. And then three is vulnerability or the unwillingness to be vulnerable, but practicing vulnerability. But number four is the immature brain. Now, okay. remember that male brain isn't fully formed until 22, 23. Yes. Mine was like 33, <laughs> right? But the point is that kids... And I, I give this lesson to teachers all the time when they, you know, that kid is the problem or this kid won't behave. And I say, listen, you have to understand that kid's operating on one thing. You ready for this? His feelings. It's like bringing a dog in and pulling out a steak. The dog's going to come over and try and get the steak. Mm -hmm. When you take a kid, you know, a nine, ten year old, and you say, would you like a piece of candy? I said, a piece of candy, right? What does that kid do? That's Take right. it Because he operates on his... Instincts or... His feelings. Yeah. Just like a dog would. And that's okay. And I tell teachers and parents, it's okay. They're operating on their feelings. Don't be too hard on them. As, but this part of the g brain is growing, mm -hmm. right? The, the prefrontal cortex is growing. Mm -hmm. Those neurons where all that executive function happens. But... The thinking. That's right. But you have to expect and understand that kids, especially in the fifth, sixth, seventh grade, they're not gonna have as much empathy just naturally mm -hmm. because they're operating on their feelings. Now that doesn't mean that you can't work with them and work on them with mindfulness. Mm -hmm. right? Mindfulness means we slow down and we think mm -hmm. and we put ourselves in the moment. Yep. 
So when, if, if you were a parent or a teacher, I certainly don't have time to go into all the activation lessons that we work on, but when I go into schools and we talk about the death of empathy and teachers and parents say, what can we do? I say, why don't we work on the empathy killers and put things in place to activate it? Because Linda, there's no bullying problem in America. That's been around since the beginning of humanity. People uh, degradating, uh, power differential, it's been around forever. Do, do we need to continue to focus on it and work on it? Sure we do. The problem is the absence of sweethearts and heroes, people that give hope and people that are willing to jump into action and help someone when they need it. Mm -hmm. And it's not bullying, it's hopelessness. And we have a generation of kids that are more hopeless than ever before in history. And one of the things that we've identified is the death of empathy. And we've got to reactivate it in our children today. And that will fix the, and, and, and change the trajectory if we can do that. That's interesting. Um, I, I think some of that may have to do with the things they're exposed to. Sure. Um, if there are things going on in a household. Sure. Um, that are not right sure. and that the child becomes fearful they're going to withdraw mm -hmm. right and and I doubt that they would go to someone and say this is going on in my house because they're not old enough to sure. you know there are all kinds of things so um, building hope and reaching out sure. to people um, helping them to reach the place where they need to, to be. One of, one of the things that really separates us from a lot of other uh, people that talk about bullying and negative behavior towards kids, especially kids like you were talking about that come from tricky situations, uh, difficult situations, mm -hmm. adversity, um, maybe home lives that aren't the best. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't matter to me. I know that human beings outside of food, shelter, and water, right? We, that's what we all need. Mm -hmm. Outside of those three things, if people, if parents and teachers can understand that humans have a need for two things, outside of these, the magic three, mm -hmm. food, shelter, water, humans have a need for two things, significance or purpose. What's your significance? What's your purpose, right? A lot of people don't figure that out for a long time. That's right, and when you have children that don't have significance or purpose, they typically end up in a pretty, in, in a struggling place. Mm -hmm. And significance or purpose, what is that? It could be cars, it could be music, it could be oh, a yeah. lot of different oh, things. Yeah. And I tell teachers and parents, your only job in life, and, and I don't really mean only job, but your, what, what you should job. be focusing on with children is not what, you want their significance and purpose to be. And it's really funny because we, we, if you think about it this way, we assign names to kids which gives them their significance or purpose before they're even born. Mm -hmm. Think about that one. But what we do as parents is we shift what we want for them. And the youth sports culture is the best example of this. Oh, yeah. I want my kid to be this. Yeah. I want my kid to play this sport. When what you're really saying is, you want to play this sport, yeah. you want to do that. I mean, how many moms and dads say to little girls, oh, you, I don't want you to be a hair cutter, that's, you, that's beneath you. Mm -hmm. And I love having that conversation with moms yeah. and dads, and I say, well, you don't want her to do that, but that's what maybe she that's, wants to maybe do. Maybe that's who she is. That's right. So our job as parents, and our job as teachers should be to foster and grow significance and purpose. purpose. Now, number two, what a gift. It, th that's the only gift that a kid really needs. I mean, they need love, and yeah. but what I'm saying yeah. is feed it, feed that significance, that purpose that a kid has. But number two, the only other thing a human being needs is acceptance. We're, as I said before, we're pack animals. And I love talking to parents about this because I say, <laughs> this is what I say to them. I say, let me prove it to you. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm not a pack animal. And I say, okay. And I say, before the age of 10, when your parents wanted to punish you, they sent you to your room. Oh, wait, wait. 
you mean they kicked you out of the pack. Because the only pack that meant anything to you, family, before you were, before the age of 10, 11 or 12, was your family. They isolated you, yeah. and isolation is the worst form of torture for a human. We know scientifically that after three days, there's measurable amounts of brain damage. If you isolate a human for three days, wow. there's measurable amounts of brain damage. If you isolate a human longer, they'll even turn to self mutilation, oh. self harm. And that's something we know a lot about with our youth today. Um, after the age of 12, 13, 14, when your parents really want to punish you, they keep you from your... Friends. Friends. Wait, they kick you out of the pack. They take you out of the pack. So once a kid, and I'm getting back to your original um, statement, um, once a kid hits those years and they leave, from, they go from one pack to the only pack that really matters are their peers, mm -hmm. our message is not set up for Tom to come in and give hope to some kid. Our message isn't for Rick to come in and give hope to some kid. I mean, we hope some of that happens, but our message is to activate those other young members of the pack, right? that have hope inside of them, that have the ability to jump into action. The bystanders, right? We know that 85% of bullying and negative behavior happens in front of other people. They all see it. Mm -hmm. Now, 96% of the time, that behavior's gotten away with. No, but teachers don't see it, parents don't see it, but all the kids know where it happens, when it happens, why it happens, and who it happens to. And if you can turn the other kids, the bystanders, into sweethearts and heroes, they can change the environment. That's right. We don't have to. That's right. You know what? I, um, I, when I was speaking to a group of students, I said, first of all, everyone needs acceptance. We, everyone, every one of you needs, wants to be accepted. And I said, anyone who bullies other people is telling everyone who's there who you are as a person, even more so than what you're saying about the, the person that you're bullying. Yeah. You are telling people who you are. And that's not a good thing. Yeah. So. One of our, we, we, have, uh, we do all day teacher seminars we have like two full day teacher Fantastic. seminars that we do. We just finished one in Syracuse not too long ago and uh, about 70 teachers, um, wow. which is great. Because wow. that's when you really get to touch. Did they have a lot of questions? Oh, tons, tons. But we work on them with a couple different things. And one of the things we have are our, of our 13 pillars. And one of them, I, I love when people say things like you just said, because <laughs> you just nailed a pillar right on the head. <laughs> because I would tell teachers that behavior is a form of communication and when that kid is acting um, poorly treating someone bullying someone mm -hmm. I would say pay attention because they're communicating with you and something else is going on in their life that's and right if we want to be real we're talking about a child right that has an unformed brain and I always tell teachers don't be too hard on that kid I know what they're doing is wrong and I wouldn't want someone doing that to my kid mm -hmm. the most important thing in my life but <clears throat> Be careful because that kid's lashing out for a reason. And yes, and sometimes it's a need to try to bolster their own image sure. in front of the others. Pack members. That's that. Yeah, the pack members. That's what they think sure. could happen. But anyone who has has a perspective sure. um, about being kind to others. Um, doesn't see the bullier in that light. Yeah. They they want they need to bolster their themselves. I think. Sure. Well, moms come to. I, I had a mom not too long ago come to me and call me up and say, um, "You said, Tom, Tom, my my daughter's being bullied." And I said, "Okay, well, let's talk about it. Tell me the story." And I say, uh, "What's her name?" And gave me her name. And I said, "What grade is she?" And she said, "Well, she's in kindergarten." Oh my. And, you know. And anyone watching, you know, I, I caution you because um, there's a mom or dad out there that's watching and say, I know exactly what she's talking about. My daughter in first grade is being bullied too. And 
I don't honestly know if bullying happens in kindergarten or first grade. And this is what I explain to moms and dads. I say, you know, little boys at home, mommy calls daddy stupid, daddy slaps mommy, kid comes to school, calls people stupid and slaps them. Mm -hmm. Is he a bully or is he just replicating the only thing he knows how to do? Mimicking the example that's, that's right. in his life. That's right. Yes. And we call it one of our pillars is modeling behavior. Yeah. And um, leadership and parenting is never about what we say. It's about what we do. Oh, absolutely. And um, Don't tell your kids one thing and then you do something right. differently. And all too often that's what we do. Or just don't give them instructions. I always say to parents, I say, Simon says, make a circle. So go ahead. Oh. No, with your hand like oh. this. Oh. Right? <laughs> now, anyone out there watching, I would say, make a circle. Now, you're ready for this. Simon says, put the circle on your chin. Now, what did I say, Linda? Put it on your... Oh, my God. Chin. <laughs> uh, Linda. Yeah, that is so funny. Now, the visual. Oh, I, right. I followed your visual. That's right. Amazing. And I can explain that to parents easily. In the 1970s, we figured this out. <laughs> it's like a magic trick, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. Okay. So in your motor is cortex, it? yes, <laughs> there's these special neurons that you were born with, and they're called mirror neurons. Mm -hmm. And babies have them, and adults have them. And all they're designed to do is follow motion, right? So when amazing. you tell some, a child... And here's what I tell parents, because parents say, well, what can I do to, to help teach my kid? And here's the simplest lesson. All of us were taught hope this way, to give hope this way. This is how most of us were taught. We were walking out of the grocery store at five, mm -hmm. and our mom had our hand. And as we got to the door, here comes that homeless guy. And our moms did this. And, and there's no criticism here because it's biology, it's mom wanting to protect us. Oh, absolutely. And this is what mom did. Ooh, let's let him go by, honey, right? And then as the child gets older, we tell that child, make sure you go to school and help those kids that are different. But what did they see for half of their life? A different example. They saw mom and dad protecting them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying it's wrong, mm, no. but they saw something completely different than what they were being told. That's right. Yeah. And if I, told, if I were to talk to any mom or dad to their face, I would say, when was the last time they saw you on a regular basis helping hopeless people? Oh, well, we volunteered at the soup kitchen on Christmas. I say, one time on Christmas? Mm -hmm. And you want this child to grow up and, and, and change the world? You want this child to grow up and change people's lives because they saw you one time at Christmas helping someone? I say, they got to see you yeah. do things all the time to make a difference in people's lives. Live it. And then you don't have to worry about it. They'll just do it. Yeah, the example. That's right. It's the old thing. I th think you said it. You know, it's your children learn not what you say so much as what you do. Amen. Live the, live the example. That's right. So it's, um, it's a big responsibility. You have four children, yeah. correct? I do. Um, and, it, and it's a huge responsibility to, um, uh, do they ever go and see what you're doing? Yeah, it's my, my daughter Abigail has been, she's our camera lady. Oh, good. Yep, woman, and uh, she's 19, and she spends the last two years with Rick and I. Oh, wow. And uh, she films everything, and, um, and the other ones will take little parts here, a little there. But, you know, what you just said was really important. You said it's a big responsibility. And I do a lot of parent stuff around the country. And, you know, we'll present to teachers and kids all day. And then we'll find ourselves still at the school at 8 o'clock at night talking to parents that come for sure. a, a, an assembly. Um, and, you know, I, I, th this is fascinating to me. And this is how I open my parent presentation. I always say... Um, What's the most important thing in your life? And I usually pick the principal because he or she is an easy target. And uh, I say, okay, Mr. Principal, what's the most important thing in your life? And then before he or she answers, I cut them off. I say, let me answer for you. <laughs> You're going to tell me your children and or your wife and or your faith are the top three. Mm -hmm. So I can nail pretty much everybody's top three. Some people will say myself 
which is important. You got to take mm -hmm. care of yourself. Mm -hmm. So, but let's just say these top three. And then as we go down the list, number four becomes maybe your hobby or what you are passionate about. Mm -hmm. right? Maybe you didn't make fishing your job, but that's what you love. Mm -hmm. So you say fishing is number four. Okay. Right about number five, you'll get to your career, right? Maybe number six. So then I always say to the principal, I say, okay. I say, how long did you spend working on your education before you got your job. Now follow me here. Before you got your job, mm -hmm. you spent at least between elementary school, middle school, high school, undergraduate and graduate, at a minimum you spent 20 years. Is that correct? I'm like deposing them, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, is that correct? And they're like, yeah, I spent about 20 years. And I say, okay, before you got your job. Yeah, I say, okay. So that was number five on your list, was your career. Mm -hmm. And you spent 20 years preparing for it. Now I'm picking up what you said about the responsibility we have here. The number one thing on your list was your children. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How many years did you spend preparing <laughs> before you got your children? That's a great question. Preparing to be a, pre a parent, you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the number one thing on your list. And you can still look me in the eyes and say your kids are the most important thing in your life. When you spent 20 years preparing before you got your job, and you're still going to look me in the face and say that your kids are the most important thing in your life. And you didn't prepare for them. You just had them and wung it. You just winged it. Well, let me be the devil's advocate a little bit. Um, depending upon... Um, how you lived your life through those years right. when you were getting your education. Were you taking classes um, that had to do with things that matter in, in a family sure. situation? Or what kind of a household were you brought up in that you saw uh, skills or, or um, what's the word I want? examples sure. of things that helped you to understand about being a parent. Sure. But I understand your point about all those years. Sure. Um, that's, that's an interesting... So typically I let the principal off the hook and I say, well, you know, that's just what humans do, right? They, they, we've, we've been doing it forever. We're like most mammals. We have a kid and then we figure it out, right? So I'll let you off the hook. Now, <laughs> let's go back to these again. And I would say, what was number four on your list? Uh, fishing, right? Yes. Let's just say it was yeah. fishing. Okay. How many articles did you read on fishing last year? How many blogs did you go to on the computer? How many videos did you watch? How many television programs did you watch? How much coaching did you get? Did you go to any seminars on fishing? And you start to write these things down, and you find this giant pile of effort and time mm -hmm. that this principle put into number four on his list. And I say, okay, now, how many articles did you read on being a dad? How many blogs did you go to? How many videos did you watch? Did you get a coach to become a better dad? <laughs> did you go to any seminars last year? Mm -hmm. It's a tough thing. Yeah. Because, and this was all triggered from your comment when you said, it's a tremendous responsibility. Oh, it's huge. And I crossed this bridge myself, Linda, a couple years ago when I said, I'd say in my heart that my kids are the most important thing. Actually, my wife's the most important thing. Of course. Thing. But my kids are right on that list mm -hmm. at number three sure. or so. Sure. But what effort am I putting in to becoming a better dad every day? Mm -hmm. And. I always turn, because everyone in the audience when I do one of these parent presentations is watching and they're saying to themselves, oh my God, I had a kid, I'm just figuring it out as I go and I'm putting no effort in on a daily basis. And then I always turn to the audience and the principal and I say, listen, we just saw 2,000 kids today and there's about 40 of you here. I said, you all get a gold star because you're doing exactly what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You're here. You're putting the effort in for the most important thing in your life. And if anybody stuck around to watch you and I talk about this, mm -hmm. I give you a gold star. Mm -hmm. Because you stuck around to get some information on the most important thing in your life, which are your children. 
You know, I have a grandson in North Carolina. Uh, he and his wife are expecting their first child. Wow, congratulations. May, May 22nd. Yeah, great grandma <laughs> to be. And um, I, well, she's a nurse. Superhero. Uh, yes, a superhero. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, he's an engineer. So it should be, it should be interesting, but he's not a big emoter. Yeah. You know, he, he's very, very smart. A lot going on. Emoter. Uh, Emotions. Emotions, okay, yes. okay. Um, it's not that he doesn't feel them, he just doesn't express them. He's got to practice. He yeah, can practice yeah. vulnerability. Well, you can tell him that. I That's called good. him um, last week. I don't talk with him very often because he has to travel part time sure. and everything. So um, I said, just think, Eric, this little baby of yours is growing inside of Abby. And in a matter of just a few months, you're going to hold that precious little girl. And I'm telling you, you're going to have feelings like you never knew you had. This precious little girl of yours yeah. who's going to need, you know, need your guidance and love and everything through the years. And he says, I'm really excited. <laughs> Which, you know, for him, the, I thought that was pretty good. But he's a, he'll be a great dad. He'll be a great dad. I know that. But um, it's, oh, oh, we have a caller. Okay. Caller, w welcome to the show. What's on your mind? Well, I'd love to jump into this. Go ahead. Jump in. Linda and I are more of the same generation than Tom. And um, things are much simpler <laughs> we were raising our kids. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. But I'll make a little statement, then maybe a couple of questions. Uh, most successful people in the world I've ever run into, or I should say almost all of them, uh, they, they possess one thing, and that's self-discipline, mm. inner discipline, self-discipline. Yeah. That's a good When one. I was raising my kids, that's the number one thing I taught them. I, I'd go, I do it with my grandchildren today. I do this little, little show-and-tell thing with them. Oh, you're out with your friends, and your friends... You know, you want to be accepted. It's called peer pressure. And you're going to have opportunities where, you know, one of your friends is going to ask you to do something that's stupid. <laughs> and you know it's not right. And, uh, and you know, if you stand up against them and say, oh, no, I'm not going to participate, oh, they're going to make fun of you. They're going to call you, you know, yeah, you're just a baby. Yeah, I know we're not, you know. I says, no, no, you've got to be strong. You got to know you're right because just because somebody wants to run over a cliff, you don't follow them. You're smarter than that. So I'm leading into my question: is is I take it my my perception of modern day people and social media obviously is the is the biggest culprit here because when I went to grade school, 55, 60 years ago, you know we had like 100 kids in three three room school. You know, and if some little kid was getting bullied by a bigger kid, Tom, you know how that was taken care of. Sure. They bloodied his nose. The big kids just beat him up. End of story. Of course, today, you'd probably end up in court <laughs> if you did that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just think that there is a certain demographic out there among the student population, given their background, that are more, much more susceptible to being bullied. Because some kids in high school, you can't bully them. It's impossible. They have too, high, too much self-esteem. And they've been taught that at home. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that. So let me say a couple things. Number one, uh, you're, in my opinion, you're dead on. Uh, I've kept this quote on my phone underneath here, Linda. You can't quite see it. But, you know, it's a Harry Truman quote. And mm -hmm. Truman said, in reading the lives of great men, and I added it, and great women, in reading the lives of great men, the first victory they won was over themselves. Oh, With yes. all of them, self-discipline came first. So for me, one lesson I always work on with kids is self-discipline. So our callers, in my opinion, dead on. One of the greatest things is self-discipline. Um, it's a huge skill that parents need to show. But mm -hmm. when you're not showing your kids self-discipline, how are they supposed to develop self-discipline? Right, but we all understand there are a lot of parents out there that are of low self-esteem to begin sure, with. Sure, sure. And they don't have self-discipline. Sure. So uh, obviously their offspring 
Uh, the important thing is to get, if you can, is to get their offspring involved in extracurriculars. Sure. Because if they're part of something, you know, they'll be taken care of. Sure. Whether it's drama, whether it's the band, whether it's a sports team, it's, it, you know, they'll be taken care of by their teammates sure. as a rule, you know, uh, unless it's an odd exception. So I, I, I think one way to help solve bullying is to get these kids involved in something. Be part of something. So they're not out there alone just on an island, which so many of them are in grade school and high school today. But and I'm not, there's no easy answer. I mean, today, compared to when I was a kid and Linda was a kid, I mean, they, they, this is light years away. It's a different I mean, this world. is a tough problem today. There's no doubt about it. But in the same token, I think it's quite simple still. Well, it's a different world than I grew up in, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and a lot of it, um, I, I would like to erase a lot of what's going on today and, and um, make, make life a lot simpler, but I don't have that kind of power. <laughs> well, our caller did say what we had been talking about is acceptance, you know. And self-acceptance, too. Self-acceptance, but he hit the nail on the head. Once you're accepted by certain peers, but then he talked about that significance or purpose. He's right. We've got to get kids involved in things. And the first thing I work on with a parent is exactly what he said when they say, my son, my daughter, they're sitting at home, they're not doing anything. Well, you've got to get them involved in something. Right? Something that they're, they're interested in. That's right. That they're interested in, not you, mom or dad. You might make some suggestions for them, but just let all you got to do is pay pick. attention. Oh. Just pay attention to what they like and Absolutely. what do they watch on TV. If they're watching somebody fly a plane all the time, they probably want to learn to fly yeah. or they want to be part of that. So, but kind of get to his question. Um, right, Carl, are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. So, so as you said, your, your question, help me out here. Um, towards the end because I got a little derailed on self-discipline and significance and acceptance. Um, help me out on your question towards the end. Oh, really? I have no, I have no question. I, 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 if, if, you, if you know me, I have a lot more, <laughs> I have a lot more opinions than questions. <laughs> but I, I'm just going to leave you with this. And I, I was, this, is, this is so important for any parent out there listening. Uh, I don't care what your socioeconomic background is. One of the most important things you can know and never give up, know who your kids' friends are. Know mm -hmm. who they're hanging out with. Uh, that was almost number one with me. me and, I did, and I kind of did it like the CIA, quite frankly. <laughs> it was kind of done covertly. But I knew who they were hanging out with. And if I found that I didn't like who they were hanging out with, well, quite frankly, there was hell to pay. Yeah. And uh, I, made it, I made it quite clear to them that, you know, you'll get some sweets. If, if, we, if we change this, but fortunately, in my case, in most instances, never had to do that. So. But uh, that's all I got to say. I, I'm, I'm a lot more opinionated than I am a questioner. Well, and with that, good show. Enjoy it. Well, thank you for calling and for your thoughts. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. Take yeah, care. You know, again, that's that pack. And when you start running with a pack that's, you know, looking for acceptance themselves. The drug scene. That's right. But those kids are looking for something, too. Oh, of and, course. And not, not saying it's right. I, I remember the other thing I was going to say about what, what he had to say. Um, you know, I, I talk to parents a lot about this, too. I think even in my generation, when I was in school 20 years ago, we had peer pressure because we got to see our friends. This is where some of the dynamics have changed. We saw our friends pretty much unsupervised on Fridays and Saturdays. Right? So we had a limited time to be pressured into certain things. Today, that's not the case. I say it's more peer acceptance than it is peer pressure because today's kid, to his point, your friends and the pack know what you're doing and what you're not doing almost 24 seven, right? Yes. There's no reset button. You got to run home after school for the weekend some kids will tell you Monday's the worst day of the week because you can't escape it. I, I love school. Oh, I love school. Yeah. I'm I, talking about the negative behavior. Oh. Some kids can't escape it. There's no reset button. You don't put your whole life on Facebook yeah. either. Well, you, you don't. I don't. I, I'm not on Facebook. I got off that. You, you don't. But their brains, 
There's a great book uh, called by a guy named Nicholas Carr. It's called The Shallows, and uh, Nicholas Carr explains this: that their brains are literally wired differently than yours. Because the, the, of this? Yes, the, because they were born with this in their hand. Right? It's just part of their DNA. It's not you and I don't understand that. Here's the way I explain it to parents. You know, my generation, my grandparents thought that the microwave was going to kill everybody, <laughs> right? And they said it's this evil thing and it's gonna kill everybody. Well, we're doing the same thing again by saying this evil thing is going to be the death of us. It certainly has changed the dynamics. And for the first time though, it really has changed the physical structure of the brain wow. in our children. So wow. some powerful stuff there. You know, just a couple of quick things. I yes, because we're tell. down five minutes. Yeah, I, because I, I always try and leave some parents with some Go tools. Go right ahead. And one thing I would always tell a parent um, is understand the difference between bullying and conflict. Um, conflict isn't bad, right? Great businesses are made on conflict. As long as it's verbal and not. I'm, I'm talking about when we had a ball on the playground and I say, it's my ball. You said. It's my ball. It's my ball. It's my Fine. ball. We had conflict and then we turned to someone and we said, whose ball is it? <laughs> oh, it's her ball. Fine. Okay. Right. We resolved the conflict. Yeah. Kids don't get the chance to resolve conflict that much anymore, right? So let kids resolve some conflict. Understand bullying is being afraid or intimidated, mm -hmm. right, over and over again. The bullier? A child that's bullied. So oh, if okay. your child is experiencing fear, 170,000 kids skip school every day in this country because they're afraid to go to school. So fear is the sign. Not that your kid didn't get along with someone. That's not bullying. Number two, don't tell, parent, don't tell your kids to ever ignore it. I think it's a giant mistake. It's like if you and I are exactly. Linda, if we're married, and you come home from work and you're like all upset because your boss is just kind of being a, a jerk, and I say to you, oh, just ignore him, honey. Oh, and grab me a beer, would you? <laughs> you would never, do, you wouldn't it like that. Yeah, no. How would a child with an unformed brain? So don't ignore it. Understand the difference between conflict and bullying. And, and number three, I would just tell you, um, I lost my train of thought, and I know we got two minutes left, um, is listen to them. Yeah, oh, absolutely. You gotta listen to them. You know, Tina Meyer, the last thing her daughter said before she walked up the stairs and took her own life, she said, how come you're never on my side? Aww. And Tina was on her side, but she really wasn't listening to everything her daughter was really saying. Yeah, so listen are, to them. Are they hearing what you're saying? Yeah. You know, you have to kind of verify there, you know, it's, it's very sad. I mean, there are some great parents out there. And, you know, as you were speaking, I was thinking of, you know, the sports and, and the teachers and everything. There's a wonderful coach like yourself, but in the athletic arena, for instance, can be the right, with the right attitude, you know, the right mode can make all the difference sure. too with kids. You know, sure. so there are opportunities out there. And I thank you so much for what you're doing, Tom. It's easy. Well, because it comes from the heart. Yeah. Um, There's nothing more important than all those kids out there. You bet. And they're the future. Yeah, they sure are. And they need to have that kind of support. And the families do too, and the teachers. Everybody needs it. Yeah. So thank you so much for My what pleasure. you do. Thank you for coming on the show. Folks, thank you for tuning in. Um, I will see you again next week with another great guest. Have a super week, and don't forget to watch the uh, State of the Nation tonight Sweet. speech. Good night. Mm -hmm.